Okay, uh, welcome to the third in our series of copyright webinars. Um, this is Creative Commons in the Public Domain. Uh, my name is Jennifer Kelly. I am the faculty copyright liaison in the library, and I'm also the faculty professional development coordinator. Um, I think Creative Commons in Public Domain is probably the most fun of the series because it involves a lot of free resources and kind of cool things to play around with. Um, feel free to ask questions as I am doing our present, going through the presentation today. Um, if you type something into the chat box, it'll pop up and I'll get a little notification and I'll respond to that as soon as I can. Um, if you could just go ahead and in, at the bottom of your screen, there is, let me go back to my pointer here. You won't be able to see it too far, but if you imagine the pointer is upside down, <laughs> pointing down to the bottom, um, there should be a little stick figure of a person raising their hand. So if you can hear me clearly and I'm speaking at a reasonable, yep, there you go. <laughs> speaking at a reasonable pace, um, if you could just raise your hand or give me a smiley face or something like that, just so I know that I'm audible to y'all and if let's see great so I'm going to type into the chat but chat just to make sure that if there's somebody who can't hear me they know that I'm asking this question um, another thing you can do with Collaborate Ultra is at the bottom left, um, a couple over from the little stick figure raising their hand. They're not really a stick. Um, there should be a little picture for your profile. Um, and that's your status and settings. If you hover, hover over that, it'll tell you that. Um, here you can indicate that you're away. So if you need to step away from your computer, um, you can give feedback, happy, surprised, sad, confused. Hope nobody is sad during the course of this presentation. Um, you can also uh, tell me to go faster or to slow down. You can agree, or disagree, um, lots of different options for you. So um, if you, so hopefully you know, feel free to play around with those. Raise your hand, give me some feedback, whatever works best. Okay, I'm gonna lower people's hands. There we go. Let's get started talking about Creative Commons and the public domain. Want to begin with um, a quick question for you guys, um, and again, you can use the chat box or you can use the uh, whiteboard tools. I believe you should be able to write on the screen. Yep, you can. Um, tell me what you know about the Creative Commons and what you know about public domain. Whatever words come to mind, thoughts, phrases, even questions that you might have your reasons for being here, just go ahead and, and share those. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to do that. Okay, we've got that Creative Commons is stuff that you can use anywhere, anytime, but you have to attribute anybody else. It's okay to share questions too. Basically nothing, that's fine. Uh, public domain is old stuff and no longer is copyright. Um, open resources and research tools, okay. Great, this is a good place to start. Um, we'll be going through um, both of these, one at a time, public domain um, and then Creative Commons. Let's start with a primer on the public domain. And a little bit of going back, for those of you who have attended all of these workshops, some of this will be familiar. Uh, a little bit of background for copyright in general. Um, according to the Constitution, um, Congress has the right to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So copyright covers the useful arts part of things, or most of them. So as we know, um, copyright protects uh, creative works and the, the bar for creativity is pretty low. Um, 
original works, again, creative original works um, in a fixed format. All right, so uh, public domain is the commons, the shared collective works of, of all of these, these useful arts and sciences, these works that have expired, that have um, their term is up. So the idea is that we're giving time for authors and inventors to have exclusive rights. They are the only ones who say, I um, take a photograph. As the copyright owner, I have limited time and to have exclusive rights such as um, selling it, sharing it, displaying it publicly, making derivative works, performing it. Um, those are the, the things that only I, as the copyright owner, am allowed to do with these things. Um, back in the day, way back when the um, when copyright was first legislated, the term was only 14 years. So I created something, a piece of music, a piece of art, uh, wrote a novel, wrote uh, history. I'd have 14 years of exclusive rights to sell that, to do whatever I like with it, make derivative copies, perform my play, um, and make money off of it. After those 14 years, it would enter the commons, where it would be owned by the public, and you could, the public could do whatever they want with it. Um, examples of things that are in the commons right now would be plays of Shakespeare. Right? You could probably think of a lot of others, but chances are if a public school um, performs it, it's in the public domain. And public schools perform these things because it's free for them to do so. They are not held by uh, copyright restrictions. In 1978, the, the Copyright Term Extension Act um, retroactively extended the duration of copyright to the life of the author plus 70 years. So going all the way back to 1923, Everything from 1923 through 1978, oh, welcome back, Melissa, um, or through the present, um, none of these things join the commons or enter the public domain for 70 years plus the life of the author. So this is a very, very long time. Um, and it has, studies show that it does not have um, it, a positive economic impact, um, and it actually has a negative impact on um, the cultural commons. And w I think one of the most surprising things that I learned in doing my research is that, so it's not just that we can't, you know, adapt somebody's work and do what we want with it, but it's also preventing us from doing things like uh, preserving works. So a derivative, for example, would be taking a film and putting it on a stable, uh, piece of media. So there are reels of film out there in the world that are literally crumbling to pieces, falling apart, books as well, um, and we can't do anything about that because they're protected by copyright, and to put them on another format um, would be cost prohibitive. It's problematic, um, but the it's uh, that's the way that it is. Uh, the Copyright Act of 1978 has has made that change. So the public domain um, currently is limited to works published from 1923 or before, with some other exceptions. Let's take a look. Um, and I gave you the answer to this, but let's see if you're paying attention. <laughs> so which works are not in the public domain here? And I'm going to, let me give you guys a poll here just so we can play with polling. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five choices. Start the poll. Okay, you have the option to pick. Let's line up one, number one with A. Someday I'll remember to do this. Um, so go ahead and use that poll to click on what you think. The answer is. Oops. All right, can everybody see the poll? I just want to make sure. Can't see the list. Let me see. Let me see what happened here. 
End polling. Poll is on top. Oh, you can't see the list. I see. Gotcha. Let me move that. Da, da, da. Um, oh, it won't let me move it. Well, that's a nuisance. Um, try making your screen bigger. Oh, no, here we go. That's the problem is making the screen bigger. Let me try this one more time. Yeah, let's give it another whirl. No. Well, that's never going to help. Okay, we'll get rid of the poll. We're going to end the poll. And I'll just let you use the chat box. Or you can you put a little check mark on the screen. As bad planning on my part. There we go. So let me know, without the poll, which you think is not in the public domain. Oh, looks like we've got, we almost have a consensus there. I've got someone with D. Is that everybody? I think that's everybody. Okay. Um, the answer is C. So works published after 1922, before 1964, are not in the public domain. But the good news is, is that starting next year, <laughs> These, these works will finally enter the public domain for the first time since 1977. New works are actually entering the public domain. So um, it's all very confusing. Let me show you something that I use frequently to figure this stuff out. Let's go to the next slide. Here we go. Oh, too fast. Here we go. So this is the digital copyright slider. And uh, you can imagine what this would look like if it were a physical thing, you know, one of those little slidey deals that, you know, can line up the little arrow and it will give you answers. Um, it's great fun to play with online. I'm going to share the URL. Um, but this is linked off of the library's copyright page as well. Um, so you can see all the different conditions. And pretty much everything that is... Um, Underneath, before 1923, almost all of these say maybe. So there's there's a lot of conditions to think about. So public domain can be complicated by things like term extensions, individual versus joint authors, corporate authorship. So tools like this can be really helpful guides. Um, but you can sort of rest assured that something published before 1923 is in the public domain. And there's all kinds of like, odd stories. Like for the longest time, um, It's a Wonderful Life, that movie, was in the public domain. And technically the movie itself still is because they failed to renew their copyright. So as you can see, one of those little options in here, let me grab my pointer here, is, okay, published with a copyright notice but not renewed after 28 years. So the copyright notice for It's a Wonderful Life had not been renewed. So it expired out of copyright. It was a uh, subject of a lawsuit, of course, because nobody wants a movie to actually expire out of copyright before its time. Um, but this is sort of why the movie became so popular, because people were able to play it on TV and in theaters endlessly without having to pay for it. Um, the lawsuit ended up determining that while the movie itself was out of copyright and in the public domain, um, this was complicated by the soundtrack, which was still protected by copyright, and the book that the movie is based on was still protected by copyright, so there was a conflict there, um, and the result was the ability for, I'm going to forget which network it plays this every Christmas, but they are allowed to play it uh, once a year without any kind of um, licensing issues. So that's the consensus. NBC. I was, I was going to guess NBC. Yeah. So that's the story of um, confusing public domain things, and uh, it's a wonderful life. See, now you know. You can tell a story about public domain. 
there are three categories of works that are in the public domain. I'm going to talk about each of those briefly. Um, the first is works that automatically enter the public domain upon creation because they're not copyright protected. So that includes things like titles, names, short phrases and slogans, symbols and numbers. Um, ideas and facts are not protected by copyright. Processes and systems, like the process for distillation, um, cannot be protected by copyright. Um, so that's in the public domain. Uh, government works and documents. So the image here is a WPA poster. Um, that is in the public domain because it was created by the United States government. Um, there are, of course, ex exceptions to all of these things. So for example, if the United States government contracts work with with someone that work might be protected and not in the public domain. But for the most part, these are things that are not protected by copyright, and so they're in the public domain. We're going to talk about other exceptions in a moment when we get into um, issues with trademark and other intellectual property protections, but um, these works are not protected by copyright in the public domain. Um, the second type is works that have been assigned to the public domain by their creators. This is the idea of creating something and giving up all rights to it, dedicating the work to the public domain. And if anybody has examples that they would like to share of encountering works like this or guesses on how to do this, um, feel free to share that in the chat box. Um, I'll just keep talking in the meantime. If you are familiar with the website Pixabay, um, all of the images on that website have been assigned to the public domain. So you can use them as if they were expired and published before 1923. Um, you don't have to attribute them. You don't have to pay for a license. You can do whatever you want with them. You can put them on something and sell it. Um, let me type that in for you. It is Pixabay. Yep, there you go, Pixabay. Uh, so very handy. You don't have to worry about those things at all. Yes, morgue files are also great. We're gonna, I have some resources I'll be sharing with you guys as well. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of great resources out there. Uh, the third category of work in the public domain is those that have expired into. So that's the, I think, what people are most familiar with is works that are, are no longer protected by copyright because their, their term has expired. So quick clarification about copyright versus trademark. We're not talking about trademark here, um, but there can sometimes be a little bit of confusion. Uh, so works that are not protected by copyright could still be protected by trademark, by patent, or by trade secret. A couple examples. So recipes are not protected by copyright, but the recipe for Coca-Cola is a trade secret. Uh, the phrase, let's get ready to rumble, is not protected by copyright, but it is a registered trademark. Uh, systems, methods, and processes are not protected by copyright, but frequently there are patents in place for such things. So just because it's not protected by copyright doesn't mean you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, um, and this usually falls into that area of, of let me just go back one, um, that first category of work. So this one here, which would be the things that are not protected by copyright. Um, and those might be ones you need to consider a little bit before you go ahead and do something with it. Like you somehow stumble across the, the recipe for Coca-Cola. Um, you can't publish that, you will be sued. So things to think about. So expired works in the public domain. Like I said, the most well-known examples of public domain works. So everything published in the US before 1923. Works published with a copyright notice from 1923 through 63 without a copyright renewal. So that was the issue with um, It's a Wonderful Life. All works published without a copyright notice from 1923 through 1977. And then finally, all works published without a copyright notice from 1978 through March 1st, 1989, and without subsequent registration within five years. Super confusing, right? 
the one thing I want to point out here is this information about something being published without a copyright notice. In 1989, the law changed, or 1988, I think, the law changed so that works published without a copyright notice, i.e. they were not registered with the Copyright Office, these works were still protected by copyright, even without the notice. So keep that in mind. If it doesn't have a, um, a little copyright icon on it, which you are all familiar with, I probably don't even need to draw it badly, um, things that are published without that notice are still protected by copyright um, if it was published after uh, March 1st, 1989. Make sense? Questions? And this is why we have the digital copyright slider to clarify all these, these little exceptions, right? Published under this condition between these strange dates. Final little question about public domain. Um, I'm not going to try the slide, the uh, poll again, since that seems to be working um, less than, than ideally. So I'll just have you type your answer into the chat box or make a little mark on the screen. Um, what can you do with public domain works? All right, we've got C and D. So C is correct, but so is B and A. Um, so it is all of the above. Um, there are no restrictions to what you can do with a public domain work. Um, and I think the one that people tend to get hung up on is that idea of republishing something commercially. Um, but think of um, Dover Thrift Editions, if you're familiar with those um, books. They tend to be classic literature republished very inexpensively. And they are inexpensive because they don't have to pay anybody for the text. You're just basically paying for the paper and whatever artwork is slapped on top of it and the cost of production. If, for example, you took a work that's in the public domain, like Dracula, and added some original content to it, images, you drew your, you know, your own personal illustrated Dracula, or you added some annotations along the side, or you translated it to another language. You would then own the copyright to those additional things, right? So someone couldn't take your translation of Dracula or your artwork that you published along with Dracula and then republish it itself. Does that make sense? So people can do whatever they want with the original text, but as soon as you add something new into that, um, that new stuff is protected by copyright. And this becomes relevant when we talk about the Creative Commons, uh, which we'll get to in just a moment, just some quick resources. And I just wanna stress that on the library's copyright page, let me get you the URL for that. Um, right on the page where I am sharing the presentation slides for these webinars, um, I have created a quick little guide that you can download that has links to these resources for public domain and some resources that we'll talk about in a moment um, that cover Creative Commons as well. So all of these contain public domain works. The Internet Archive, if you have not ever visited it, is amazing. These are the same people who do the Wayback Machine that allows you to look at archived um, websites. But they have all these great you know, film reels from you know, like public schools, you know, how you know, Johnny has lice and <laughs> um, duck and cover you know, under your desk to hide from the the uh, the Germans, not the Germans, I'm sorry, the Russians, it might be Germans too. I'm not sure how far back they go. Um, but all this great stuff, old music, old books. Um, Project Gutenberg is really similar, also has um, 
all these old books that have been um, digitized in different formats. So you can download them to your Kindle, you can download it as a PDF. Um, and again, if you are an artist or a translator, you can take all of these books and add whatever you want to them. You can repackage them, you can sell them. Um, it's all freely available, it's pretty cool. Um, LibriVox generally takes those books and makes audio versions of them. So if you would rather someone read Dracula to you, um, you can do that and those are made available. And then you can even remix those and do something fun with it if you want it. So endless, endless joy with public domain works. Um, if you're interested in the topic in general, the public domain review is a phenomenal um, open journal that's freely available. That's it, yep. Um, and the link is on that resource guide that is on the webinar page. Okay, any questions about public domain before we move on to the Creative Commons? Okay, if anything occurs to you, feel free to type it in, raise your hand. Creative Commons. Uh, Creative Commons is not a replacement for copyright. Creative Commons is permission given in advance. So when we talk about copyright, um, and we have in the other webinars, generally, does, although there, the authors of works have exclusive rights, frequently, especially for educational purposes, you can contact the copyright owner and say, hi, can I use this work for this purpose? And the author can say yes, or they can say no, or they can say yes, but give you some conditions. Um, and it would involve, you know, some back and forth, having a conversation, you know, signing something usually, maybe there's an exchange of money. Creative Commons does all of that upfront. So instead of having to call, say, a photographer whose work is available on Flickr.com and say, can I use your image? Um, in a presentation that I'm giving at a college to an open audience. Instead of having to reach out to that person, wait to hear back from them, get, those, get all the details negotiated, Creative Commons puts all that information up front. So I can go to Flickr and see that uh, a photographer has licensed their image for non-commercial uses and I can know that I can do whatever I want with this image as long as it's not a commercial purpose. So think of the Creative Commons license as a layer on top of existing copyrights. Any questions about that? So it's useful for two, on two sides. First, it allows the public to share their work. So I can create something and make it available. Um, yes, you can use my content that I put on my research guide freely, you know, allow other librarians, for example, to take what I've written as long as they say where it came from. I can put that on my website and people can do whatever they want with it. That's great. Um, but it also allows me to go looking for resources that I can use and remix as long as I adhere to those licenses. So that's what the Creative Commons does. There are um, all these licenses. Oh, question. If I get permission, it's okay, so long as I don't make money with it. Again, it, it depends, Pat. So um, if you are getting permission from the copyright owner through a conversation, then they're going to tell you what you can and can't do with it. With Creative Commons licenses, it's going to depend on the license. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those. There are two, three, four, five, six different licenses um, that are combinations of these four um, types. So attribution, share alike, non-commercial, and no derivatives um, are the four pieces that you'll see and they can be combined. So for example, they all have to include attribution. That's the, the basic. You have to say who created this. Um, and I can see Pat's confused, but hopefully this conversation will, will uh, clarify some things for you. 
So they all have to have attribution, but you can add these other pieces to it. So I create a, let's see, I'm going to make a terrible little drawing over here. There we go. I create a terrible drawing of a tree and a house. This terrible little drawing right now, as we speak, is protected by copyright. If you wanted to use this terrible little drawing, you would have to ask me. And I would say, of course, it's a terrible little drawing. Go for it. Uh, but if I have a license on it, and that license is uh, this one here, CC BY. You can do whatever you want with that little drawing as long as you say, this was created by Jennifer Kelly and made available through the CC BY license. Okay? If I use this other license, CC BY SA, share alike, that is, Attribution, you must say where it came from, and also whatever you do with it, you have to put this license on it. So you take my terrible little drawing, you put it on a mug, you make that available, you make money, you create a calendar of terrible little drawings, sell that, do whatever you want with it. Um, your, cal your calendar if it's all full of drawings created by me with this license on it, your calendar also has to have that license on it. So people need to be able to take what you've done and add and make and uh, attribute them and sh be ugh, excuse me and share it alike. Okay. The next is non-commercial. So we're still sticking with just attribution plus. Okay. So we're not looking at Got rid of everything there. We're not looking at share alike anymore, just attribution and non-commercial. So my terrible little drawing just got worse. Do, 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 do. Tree, house. Um, you can do whatever you want with this as long as you're not making money off of it. That's attribution non-commercial or CC by NC. Our next option is by NCSA. So you can see these are getting more restrictive as I go down, the different types of licenses I'm adding or making changes to um, make, make the license a little bit more restrictive. So you have to attribute where you got it from. You cannot charge money for it and you have to have this share alike license on it. More restrictive is no derivatives. So my terrible little drawing, you can't remix it, you can't change it. It has to be as is. A better example would be music. I create some music, you can't remix it. You can't do anything else with it, you can play it, you can put it on a CD and sell it under this license, but you can't make any derivatives. The most restrictive license is CC by NC and D. So that is attribution, oops, here we go, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives. All you can do is share it and not make money. Does that make sense? So you can see on the left-hand side of the chart here, uh, the things that you're allowed to do, share, remix, commercial, share and remix, not commercial, and here these last two are only share. And the least open, of course, is copyright. Clear questions? No questions? Excellent little bits of information about these types of things. Um, Wikipedia uses, let me see, the attribution share alike license in all of their content. Um, what else can I say about these? 
Oh, do you need a lawyer to understand this better? <laughs> it can be confusing. What I like about Creative Commons, though, is that um, one of the things that they ask is to provide these links. So you can see this, this link down here. Um, and so when you license something, um, there should be a link that takes you to the license. And there's a human readable license that tells you exactly what you can and can't do. So you're not required to memorize what these images look like um, and what they mean. You can always click and say, okay, this says CC by ND. I don't remember what ND stands for. Um, you can click through and it will tell you exactly. Let me give you an example of this um, just for quick, oops, comments, CC by 4.0. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to share a link right here. Feel free to click through um, for the human readable license for an attribution share alike. So, and it tells you right there, you are free to share, copy and redistribute the material in any medium or format and adapt remix, transform, and build upon the material for any purpose, even commercially. So it does a good job of, of explaining that and make it a little bit easier for you. So hopefully no lawyers need be involved. So a quick little refresher to see how, how much this has sunk in, if at all. <laughs> um, which of these licenses gives you the most freedom? So you have found a, a book available online that is licensed with one of these. What can you do the most with? We've got two Bs. Anybody else? Another B. We have some other thoughts. Everybody kind of agreeing with B. Some people not willing to commit. Okay, we got B. B, yep. B gives you the most freedom. Absolutely. For extra credit, who wants to say which one's the least open? D. 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 Yep. Yep, that one's attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives. That is the most uh, limiting of the licensees. Perfect, you guys are experts. So finding Creative Li Commons licensed worked. Um, Creative Commons has a website that will allow you to, to search. I use this all the time. It's, it's bookmarked on my browser. All I need to do is just type in into my browser window CC and it comes up right away. Um, I love this search. Um, I put in what I'm looking for, a noun, a concept, a whatever it is, and uh, usually Flickr. I usually I like searching Flickr for images, um, but it allows you to search all these other things. So you can also, and I want to stress this because people love using Google Images, the way that you can find Creative Commons licensed materials in Google Images is Google Images, you have to click the Tools menu and then Usage Rights, and then it will give you options to find, find works that are uh, available for any use, for non-commercial use, for you know, other restricted uses. So that's how you do that in Google Images. Otherwise, you can use um, CC Search, and it will allow, you can select um, from all these different tools. You can search Google Images, you can search Pixabay, you can search Wikimedia Commons, um, SoundCloud, CC Mixter, and Jamendo, um, or Jamendo. These three are music. Um, and you can also search, and I've never done this before until I was preparing for this presentation, um, just search Google for Creative Commons license materials, and what you end up finding is uh, works that are available Creative Commons outside of images. So you find, you know, uh, 
books and articles and all these other great things. So it's it's pretty cool. Um, it also gives you the option to search YouTube for Creative Commons licensed work for um, there's an open clip art library that you can search. So all this good stuff. Uh, I can't speak highly enough of the Creative Commons search. But of course, you always do need to double check. Um, Creative Commons search just makes connections to all these different organizations, Pixabay, Wikimedia Commons. Um, so they're not actually reading the licenses. So once you find the image that you want, double check it, make sure it um, matches up with the use that you have in mind. Okay. Best practices with Creative Commons. Um, I get a lot of questions about how to cite specifically images um, or how to attribute images when you're doing um, usually a PowerPoint presentation, but a poster or something like that. Um, the best practices is using a tassel attribution, which provides the title, the author, the source, and the license. So underneath that is an example of what that would look like, and it does have links. So this is best practices for web-based things, right? Um, Undercover Vampire Policeman, it's a song, um, by Chris Zabriskie, so that's the author, um, is available under Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. So we have the link to the license to clear up that problem of this is confusing, I don't know what this means. So it's really easy for someone to just click through and say, oh, I can do whatever I want with Undercover Vampire Policeman as long as I attribute Chris Zabriskie. Um, I have the link to the author. Um, because it's sort of best practices, right? This is in, very similar to citing a source. Um, you want to not only give credit to the author, but you also want to allow people to um, follow up, maybe discover more works by this, this person. And the same with the title. So the link will take you to the original source. You now know what it is, um, how to find it, all that stuff. Um, Check your licenses before you use them. Always, always, always. Um, make sure that it actually is licensed for the use that you have in mind. Um, everything on Google Images, regardless of whether you've selected um, adapt, you know, available for reuse, adaptable, whatever it is, um, the image is always going to say underneath it, this might be protected by copyright or something along those lines. Uh, so you need to go a little bit deeper and click through. Do not just copy and download images from Google Images. Click through to the original source and find the images there. Google actually just recently took away the option to view and download images directly from their um, image search. So it actually, when you click on the image, it will bring you to the page automatically uh, because it really is its best practices to go to the source. So you're making sure that you're attributing your uh, sources correctly. And keep track of your uses. This is maybe going a little above and beyond, but I do this with all of the images that I download especially and use in presentations, um, icons that I use on my research guides. One, so that I don't end up downloading the same thing multiple times over and over again. I can go back and find it easily because I have the link to the source, but also because Creative Commons license are non-revocable. -re irrevocable, there's the word. Um, so if I license something underneath a CC BY license, attribution only, I can't later go change that. Technically I can, I can do whatever I want, but I can't change that retroactively. So if you have downloaded my image under an attribution license and I change it to straight up copyright, I can't sue you for copyright infringement because you downloaded it under this license. If you have proof, for example, 
something like a license tracker or just like the date that you downloaded it, then you should be able to um, prove on the off chance that you do get sued um, or get a takedown notice more likely, you can prove that you downloaded it underneath this um, specific license. So I go a little bit above and beyond with this. Um, there's a, a link at the bottom of the screen which you'll have access to uh, when I post the PowerPoints to the website. Um, takes you to new, new Media Rights, which I think has really good um, examples of how to attribute Creative Commons works. Um, Creative Commons itself also has some, some best practices there too. Questions about that? Excellent. We are wrapping up here. These are just some of the organizations that um, use or display or share Creative Commons works. You might recognize some and some not others. Like I had to look up a couple of them, um, mostly the music ones I'm not familiar with, but MIT OpenCourseWare, um, PLOS, uh, Vimeo, you can find Creative Commons license things in all of these. Uh, putting a date on your attribution. You can. Um, it's not necessary if you're citing it. So I want to make a distinction between citing something and attributing it, right? So in the world of academia, we're citing our sources. Um, you would want to cite something even if it's public domain, right? So I'm taking a quote from Shakespeare. It's in the public domain. I can do whatever I want with it legally. But in the academic world, I still need to cite it, in which case I do need that year and all that other stuff. Uh, you can put any kind of information you want in your attribution, uh, but knowing that the date, the date isn't necessarily um, required. But if it helps you, absolutely. Oops, um, put the date in there. Good question. So thank you. Um, this was Creative Commons and and public domain. Um, we have one more webinar coming up on April 5th. It's going to be Copyright Basics for Online Teaching. Um, it will have a little bit of fun stuff like this, finding um, images and other content you can use freely in online classes. Um, might have a little bit more uh, legal stuff in it. Um, a little bit of the TEACH Act, a little bit of fair use. So it'll sort of synthesize, I think, some of the things that we've talked about in the, the other webinars as well. Um, you are, oh, you're welcome, Sandra. It's, it's my pleasure. Um, by the end of the week, I will have the slides up and available on the library's website. Um, let me share that link with you again. And you can see, on that page that the uh, presentation slides, webinar recordings are available for copyright and course design and for fair use. Um, the resources that I mentioned for finding Creative Commons and public domain resources um, are also available already on this page. And you can always feel free to contact me with any questions. I'm happy to, to answer and point you in the right, um, right directions. Thank you so much, Karen. All right, um, everyone have a great day and thank you for attending. Thank you for your really good questions and I appreciate your interest.